Well, hello, welcome back to Watchbox Studios. I'm your host, Tim Masso, and this is Watches Tonight. This evening, I'm talking 2021 Patek Philippe Calatravis and Complications. We're discussing the most controversial watch of the year. Hint, it involves a Panther. And I'm sharing my favorite watches from Watches and Wonders, plus your viewer wrist shots, all that tonight on Watches Tonight. Let's see who's joining in the box. Edward Ledden of Sweden, already here. Blue Shirt Buddha Watches. Watching Wonders from Frankfurt, Mr. No Date from London. We've got Alex O, Mateo C, Boutique One joining us from Poland. And uh, I gotta remind you guys, check out the redesigned homepage of thewatchbox.com. Late model pre-owned, a uh, few vintage watches, mostly late model pre-owned, and my favorite brands, of course, from Laurent Ferrier to De Betun to Gégère Lecoultre and Rescents. And of course, if you must have Rolex, we've got lots of that. Also, lots of Patek Philippe, topical and timely and relevant to today's show. Plus, I should remind you to visit me on Instagram, where you can often see one-minute videos of high-end watches that are not on our website. Some of the best stuff only sees the light of day on my Instagram in one minute video form. With over 1,400 one minute videos, you can literally binge watch one minute dramas. Each one unique, each one spectacular. All right, now let's quickly discuss the Rolex 2021 novelties no one really talked about. Because um, some of the most interesting changes were not new models. By the way, guys, I'm going to acknowledge it in the box in just a sec. While you file in, I want to give you a little bit of extra time to attend. So the GMT Master II gamed a new look. If that looks familiar, that's because that look, super case, ceramic bezel, Pepsi, oyster bracelet, it used to be exclusive to white gold. And for a good long time, from 2014 to about 2018, that black dial with the oyster bracelet, with the Cerachrom Pepsi bezel, was exclusively white gold. Well. Big change for this year. Now you can get either the Batman or the Pepsi in steel with the full oyster bracelet. All of which is to say, if you bought the original in white gold, you're probably a little bit deflated right now, but that's what Rolex does. They roll out steel versions of the precious metal watches further down the line. And having had exclusivity for over half a decade, that's a pretty good period by Rolex standards. Generally, the steel watch comes even sooner than that. So a very different look right here. Now. Another cool watch, the Sky Dweller, which has effectively become the super Datejust. <laughs> now, this is a new stainless steel Jubilee bracelet combination. It's brand new for this year. Uh, if you can consider that we've got, in the past, a Datejust, a Datejust 2, a Datejust 41, I'm tempted to call this the Datejust 3. And it probably should, since there's nothing particularly sky-dwelling about the sky-dweller. The very term sky-dweller sounds like the way a 19th century deist would describe an omnipotent god. So we're going to call this possibly the biggest makeover of the year because it really does change the look of the watch. And it really does look like a giant date just at this point. But a good-looking giant date just. Jumping into the box right here, we've got Joe Tyson from Apex, North Carolina. We've got LJR35 from Dublin. We're in Vintage Zenith tonight. We've got Kevin Hawthorne from Florida. Love watches. We've got Orange Hand joining in. MCC Le Chinois. Wolfgang Kollerer from Austria. We've got Alex. We've got Marked5493. Not first in Texas, but you know, you're first in my heart. Rick on watches. Happy to see you here. Baltimore Spirits Co. He of the tasty whiskey. And we've got Eric Nielsen. We've got Soma R. We've got Derek M, Adam Crossfire, we've got Marcin joining in from Poland, and we've got Albi E from Mallorca, Spain. Lots of folks, including Orange Hand from Ottawa tonight. A lot of good friends in the box, and some new names too. Sam Leno, I don't think I've seen you here before. I'm glad to see your name there. And 121 Click Bezel, I have seen your name many times. We've got Jonathan O joining in from Krakow in Poland. And we've got Georgette O from Madrid, plus Niku from Bucharest. All right, we're going to come back to the box in a moment. But we're going to talk about some of yours on mine, and I'm talking about watches. Viewer wrist shots number one. First, Emil G gets us off the block with his Rolex Sea Dweller 4000 Bikes and Mercedes-Benz AMG GT. Here's the same, but with the AMG and the bikes in focus. I had to include both because this absolutely knocked my socks off. Great photos, great subjects. Well done, Emil. 
Sal dares to be different with a NATO strap for his Patek Fleet 5960P behind the wheel. Very, very sharp. I'd love to see the rest of the car. Desmond O oh is grocery shopping with his 2020 Rolex Submariner Sermit Diver. Yes, that's what they're calling it now, the Sermit. It's not ceramic, it's not Kermit, it's the Sermit. And we have Zubair out for a walk with his Vacheron Constantin overseas in Doha, Qatar. And Phil C, a local boy, in New Jersey, out for a drive with his Mercedes-Benz E450 and Rolex Daytona. Burning up the road. I love it, Phil. Well done. Guys, okay, controversy. It seems that there's a lot of it these days, and you don't have to go far to find it. But more often than not, it involves a major brand. I, I can't remember the last time, for example, Louis Erard became highly controversial. Great watches, lovely special editions, but not controversial. Audemars Piguet, on the other hand, has a knack for this. And the most controversial watch of the year, Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Concept Black Panther Flying Tourbillon. And yes, this is real. So if you're just seeing it for the first time here, it is quite literally a Royal Oak Concept 42 millimeters in titanium with a ceramic bezel, a hand-carved and hand-painted Black Panther figurine on the dial of a three-day power reserve manual wind flying tourbillon, and yes, it features signature Black Panther black and purple color scheme. Okay, lots here. Step aside Zenith Chrono Master Sport because this is going to be the most polarizing luxury watch of the year and it is the undisputed king of controversy and apparently also king of Wakanda at the same time. Who knew that March's AP Marvel co-branding announcement and it seemed well, if, if not subtle, ambiguous. You didn't know what was coming next. You could use your imagination, but it had the potential to inflame opinion because some folks are just going to say flat out that a comic book figure, any comic book figure, has no place in the world of luxury watches. Now, for $162,000, we know just how far AP took that comic theme. Once again, it's not quite as big as it looks, as this is one of the 42 millimeter uh, Royal Oak concepts. It's technically not an offshore. Um, so if I've called it an offshore up to this point, I'm wrong. This is technically a Royal Oak, even though the look is very much offshore. I would also say that being titanium, it probably wears fairly light, given that it's otherwise made of sapphire, ceramic, and rubber. So this is probably a comfortable watch, but all of those details of ergonomics, hand finishing, technical specifications, in this one instance, they blur into irrelevance because you're all about whether you like this idea or not. Um, so I think there are going to be some people, unfortunately, who object to the idea of there being a black superhero on a watch, and for those people, I can't help you. But there are two primary legitimate objections to this. Uh, one is that it's not right for the brand. This idea that it's not right for the brand would be something along the lines of Audemars Piguet is a very serious thing and Marvel Comics is a very unserious thing. And I'm not sure I buy that because if you seriously need a $162,000 watch, then your definition of serious is very different than mine. Um, the, but, but again, maybe in the interest of decorum, you think of Audemars Piguet being a more kind of reserved luxury. Although I would say the 48 millimeter Royal Oak Offshore's Arnold and Shaq probably fly in the face of that notion. Uh, second, you might ask, and this is another legitimate objection, is this the right execution? Like if you're gonna do a Black Panther watch and you're okay with combining Marvel and AP, and clearly the CEO is, uh, is this just too overt? Would it be better if maybe it were black and purple on the front with a few hints at what might lie behind and then a more explicit Black Panther themed case back? Maybe even the same figurine on the case back. All I can say is that that's a legitimate objection and maybe that would have been the way to go. But then again, AP kind of has an all or nothing approach to watches that polarize opinion. And unlike the code 1159, there's nothing insipid or under-realized about this watch. If you remember the singular objection to the code 1159, every single criticism mentioned that the dials were just too flat and looked cheap. This dial's not too flat and it doesn't look cheap. So the question ultimately is, is this too dangerously close to the already existing sub $5,000 Chinese made Iron Man novelty watch from Hong Kong based Memorigen? You know, frankly, I think it might be a little too similar and I don't know if, for example, this might have launched before AP reached the point of no return on the design, but this has been around for a while. So I almost feel like AP must have known that these comparisons were gonna be drawn when it created this watch. Here's the thing, 
what if we're missing the big picture? And right here, I have a very serious watch. It is a black label Chronomet Resonals from FP Journe. It is made of platinum. It has a rose gold movement. It has horological significance. It is very sober, buttoned up, and historically important. But is it really? I think every luxury watch, after a certain point, and you're going to probably pay 200 grand, bare minimum for that. After a certain point, every luxury watch is a little bit ridiculous. None of us need these things. So while a certain watch, such as a giant comic book themed Panther, Panther Torbion, might not be to our individual tastes, I don't think you can go after it for not being appropriate for high luxury, because while this looks conventional and it checks all the right boxes and people will pat you on the back online if you buy it, it is just as absurd from a life priority standpoint. So I'm going to go out and say, this Black Panther watch is not for me. But given that it takes about 30 hours to make just the figurine out of white gold, hand carve it, and then hand paint it, it lives up to the price. It's absolutely worth the $162,000 they're asking for it, but I'm never going to be on board with the style of the thing. So again, this is going to be a love or hate watch, and I've got to think that Francois-Henri Benamia, the CEO of AP, knows for a fact he can find 250 people who love this watch. And I wouldn't even be surprised if he finds them all before Watches and Wonders is over. Okay, viewer wrist shots number two. Ari F. Dazzles with his Vacheron Constantin Overseas Self-Winding in Steel and Blue. That's a good-looking watch and a dramatic picture. Wow, you're in the running for the photography honors tonight. We've got Robert H. and Miss Kitty taking in the Moser Pioneer Center Seconds purchased from Hans at Watchbox. Hans and Watchbox, thank you, Robert. Uh, Julian S. of Southern California enjoys the sun with his Blancpain 50 Fathoms Bathyscaphe. Good looking watch, good looking shot. Probably warmer there than it is here in Philadelphia. Bud D and his AP Royal Oak overlook Olympic Park in Atlanta, Georgia. And actually you can see CNN Center in the background. That's where my stepdad used to work. Uh, we have Jim T and his Breitling Super Ocean Heritage Chronograph on vacation in Myrtle Beach. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. Okay, let's see what you guys are saying. Aziz is saying, I think it's some kind of tribute to Chadwick Boseman. That's not a bad way of looking at it, actually. Uh, right here we have Dr. Stu saying, a train wreck, but more than 250 are going to buy it. Uh, right here we have Nathan Silva saying, this Royal Oak is my guilty pleasure, but it's definitely not beautiful, but I still like it. s and saying it's Invicta looking. Right here, let's see what else we've got going on. Rick on watch is asking if I'm stretching that F.P. Journe comparison. I don't think so. Try to explain to a person that you bought a $200,000 F.P. Journe, but that that's a reasonable purchase and the $160,000 Panther watch is not. I think anyone outside our hobby is going to have a very different view of that. Now, I think it's perfect to buy either one of them, and I think it's great. I'll pat you on the back if you buy that great-looking black label Chronomet. But again, from a life priority standpoint, it's very hard to argue that one is sensible and the other is fatuous. They're both fabulous and fatuous in differing degrees. Okay, and then right here we've got Mark Margolis joining in, saying, I can barely tell the time on that thing. And then Abdul saying he's definitely a hater on that front. And then we have Domenico G saying, have you seen the prices of Richard Mille watches? Yes, there will, fools who will, there will be fools who will pay that or any price. And then we've got Phil McCracken joining in from South Carolina asking, what do I think of the new black and yellow Aquas Caliber 400? I think we're talking about the Aquas Pro, which is basically the old Pro Diver, which was a cool model. The, the Pro Dive, Pro Diver, enormous with the safe dive bezel. And that's basically what we've got with this Aquas Pro. We've got the old Pro Dive with its bezel system and its case size, but with the new Caliber 400 that has a five-day power reserve and a 10-year warranty. I would say if you're looking at something like a Rolex Deep Sea, you definitely need to con consider this. Uh, but this enormous watch, and for a lot of folks, it's either going to be a backup for your dive computer or a weekend watch only, just based on the sheer size of it. You know, we're talking 48 to 49 millimeters, unless I'm mistaken here. Okay. Okay. Da, 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 da. And let's take a look at those watches and wonders watches that I loved. 
you guys are moving this chat box fast. I can never keep up with you. Okay, so new Patek. We're going to talk about Patek Philippe first because this is genuinely news, not just editorial. All this is new today. Patek dress watches and complications launch today, and Patek wisely split its dress novelties from last week's Nautilus launch. Why? Because if you launched them on the same day, no one would be talking about the dress watches. It would be all about principally the 5711s with the green dials. And frankly, Terry Stern is smarter than that. So let's start with the 6119. This is a new 39 millimeter hobnail bezel Calatrava in white or rose gold, and they do offer different things. But both offer a new manual wind caliber 3255 with twin barrels, rare for Patek, and a 65 hour power reserve. It's a nicely made movement, though I do think that the barrel bridges are just a little too large and indistinct. That said, overall, well well done, well finished. You get a anthracite satin dial on the white gold model that has vertical satin finish and is quite attractive. Uh, and then you get more of a conventional matte silver on the rose model. Now what I like here is that both of them are retailing for $29,570. Usually you see a premium for white gold, even though there is no logical reason why white gold should cost more than rose, or for that matter, yellow. So I like that these watches cost the same amount. And I would have to say, given what people are paying for chronomet bleu these days, less than $30,000 for precious metal and a high level of finishing is a pretty good deal. Okay. The 4947-1A, we get a full steel annual calendar with full bracelet. I like it. 38 millimeters in stainless steel. It's a full bracelet complication. And as you can see, it has a fascinating dial, an outstanding linen dial. If you look right there, Patek Philippe calls this the Shantung dial. I call it a linen dial because Rolex nomenclature kind of dominates the industry. And that is the closest equivalent I could find to this sort of gradient woven pattern that's crisscrossed vertically and horizontally. White gold Arabic numerals and matching white gold leaf style hands. It is practical. As you can see, the dial is loomed, which gives it an extra measure of practicality, railroad track outboard for the minutes, and good looking. You'll note the whimsical sort of star cast in the bottom half of the moon phase. Normally this is where you're going to see some sort of constant seconds or radial date display. So take note right here, you've got this wonderful completion of a circle of the cosmos with the crescent style moon phase, which is quirky and lovable. It also features a conventional caliber 324 base, so mechanically it's competent and good looking, well finished, and they've added over the years, for example, ceramic rotor bearings and a silicon hairspring, but this is a very basic automatic movement by Patek standards, and you can see there's a little bit of a disparity between movement size and case size, but at 47900 for a stainless steel full bracelet Patek complication, I think the pricing structure makes sense by Patek standards. Now, this is the star of the show right here so far. In my opinion, Patek's best of the year. And you know how much I love a green dial watch, but I'm sorry 5711 and 5711-1300A. I am all about the Patek Philippe uh, 5236P. This is a really, can we go full screen here? This is a really good looking watch. It's also a little bit quirky, and I'll tell you why that is in just a moment. But there's a reason Patek devoted a full day to the Nautilus. You did not want to overshadow the rest of the line, and this Patek derives its design from my favorite Patek Philippe, which you guys know well. My favorite Patek Philippe is the 5235G, the regulator that nominally came out in 2011 and started shipping in 2013. And that watch, in turn, was derived from the 3448 case. But my, yep, and there you can see it right there. You've got those sharp angular lugs, you've got the conical bezel, and uh, that was itself a perpetual calendar. This is basically the same case that you get on the regulator, albeit here in platinum. Now, no longer an annual calendar or a regulator, this is a full perpetual calendar, and it includes a movement fit for the king of watches, or at least the king of complications. This one's called the 31260 PSQL. So, uh, this is a, this is a wonderful machine that is, as you can see, equipped with a finger-style drivetrain. So just like the regulator, you can see that you've got the barrel and then each individual wheel in the train after the great wheel has its own separate finger support, just like a vintage pocket watch. It is a micro-rotor automatic here with an extraordinary white gold micro-rotor. This is the first time we've seen that on a Patek watch. In the past, the micro-rotor was always made of a colored gold. Uh, it is a very handsome machine. And the first time we've seen the, two, the 31260 used in a watch other than the regulator. It's an aperture calendar, and this is where the watch is a little bit quirky, because it's 
Like those guys you've heard about whose eyes are too close together, there's definitely a little bit of weirdness in this display. And it is extremely compact. As you can see, it's narrower than the name of the brand at the head of the watch, which is both supremely unusual and a little bit counterintuitive. And my eye sort of darts up and down on this dial trying to resolve it. Sometimes the most innovative designs are the ones that don't immediately look right. But Patek does say this is an inline display that is a world premiere for a perpetual calendar. So you have the day, you have a double digit date, and then you have the month. And it's true that for a perpetual calendar, this is a world premiere, but it's not quite a world premiere as a type, given that de Batoon did this back in 2005 with the DBS Digital. And you can see there was a simple calendar on that watch, triple calendar, not an annual, not a perpetual, but they definitely had this idea first. Now, th that doesn't matter, because this watch has a gorgeous satin blue dial, and you can see the brushed strokes inherited from the 5235, very good looking, a classically beautiful dial with a little bit of an offbeat calendar display. Still a wonderful sort of bilateral symmetry. You can split this one down the middle and it has a lovely symmetry from side to side. I think this watch at $130,110 is worth it. Again, priorities, but still for $130,000 from a brand like Patek, with objectively gorgeous dial and case back, I think this is going to be a watch that stands the test of time, and I think it's going to be one of the best new watches of 2021. I'm already a fan, and I think it's Patek's best of this year, Nautilus included. So, what else do I like? I like your comments. Let's take a look here. So Lloyd Kerr is saying, that's pretty cool. Mark S. saying, Jabo Surf, I can't afford it. Right here we have 108 Apollo. I love this. John N. saying, I'm going to have to see this in the metal. Then we have... Let's see what else. Jesse M is complimenting my vocabulary. Thank you so much. If I didn't have that, I'd be on a street someplace. Right here we have John Doe saying windows are too small. You know, that's a legitimate objection that maybe the apertures, though innovative, are just a little bit too crowded. And then right here we have Monkey Sea Production saying at $130,000, I'd buy the Longa One Perpetual instead. That's a bargain. And then right here we have Tempest saying, who likes the white date versus dial aligned color for the date wheel on the Nautilus? We're still talking about the Nautilus. We, can, we can't get away from them. Right here, we have Watch H saying, the combined date window reminds me of a Seiko-style display. Not to mention blue is so overdone at this point. It's true, and shortly thereafter, green. <laughs> but blue is definitely overdone. Robert H is saying, being an owner and lover of annual calendars, 5205 and 5396, give me that 5236 perpetual any day over the Nautilus. And then Jim Millet saying, Agree, Tim, that is the Star Patek release. And, uh, you know, it's an awesome piece. We have Zane saying, already got my order in for the 5236P. Timmy, it's a bargain. And then Mateo C saying, the 5236, it's perfect. Uh, this is, I would have to say, overwhelmingly positive in favor of that watch. And I also think we've got Andrew Mark, by the way, joining in from Saudi Arabia, staying up super late, or by that point, probably super early with me. I appreciate your commitment. I think we're going to see more Patek watches this year. If you look at a year, a typical Patek year like 2019, when we had tons of variants of existing watches and tons of new models, I think that relatively few new Pateks have come out this year, and we're going to see more of them as the year rolls along. Remember, normally between SIHH and Baselworld, we're going to see like four to 600 brands launching new watches, and there were 40 brands participating in Watches and Wonders this year. So we have a lot of brands that still have to debut new watches, and a lot of brands that have already debuted new watches that want to keep some stuff in the pipeline for the middle of the year and the holiday season. So we're absolutely going to see more watches from Patek Philippe. I just don't know what and I don't know when. Okay, Nicholas Flynn, you're getting ahead of me with the Breitling Pistachio dial. Rest assured, it's coming. The Tudor Black Bay 58925. Guys, this watch is unbelievable. And I'm not a Tudor or Black Bay fan. I'm a Heritage Advisor guy and Cognac dial Heritage Advisor at that. But take that Two-Tone Explorer 36. I mean, 2021 is the year of Tudor. This, the solid gold with the green dial, the Panda and Inverse Panda Black Bay Chronos, those are great 
great watches. And judging by the wrist shots online, people are already taking delivery, which is great on Tudor's part. Wonderful and well done. I'd also say this bridesmaid kid sister no longer. Tudor has been more interesting than Rolex to date. And again, I think they have some new watches still to come. I have my doubts about the fatuous and homely display case back. This is unnecessary. That's not a handsome movement, and I would rather just have a handsome, solid silver case back. After all, you're shorting us about the same amount of sterling silver that we would get in some sort of minted coin. So I'd rather not see that movement, even though I approve of its chronometer certification, 70-hour power reserve, and resilience against magnetism. I'd also say this. It doesn't solve the problem of Tudor's over-dependence on the black bays. Tudor, more so than ever after this year, has become the Black Bay Company, and they must be scratching their heads and wondering, what do, we need, what do we need to do to have a breakout success in a different model line? Well, they haven't figured that out yet, but with watches like this, they've bought themselves a few more model years to figure it out. I will also say this, overall the watch is a winner. It manages to feel fresh without being a true redesign, and not every new Black Bay truly does feel fresh. The sterling silver, the taupe dial, the fact that this is a Black Bay 58 and thus nice and slim and nicely sized to 39 millimeters. It really does look awesome. Get it on a strap NATO, get it on a strap leather. Both look great. Uh, I would love to see it on some sort of a bracelet. And I would also say that don't buy a sub 124060. Right now, this is a great watch. You can buy it for not too crazy a premium given what the, what the Smurfs and Sermits are going for. Uh, but still, why pay $14,500 to get that used when you can buy this for $4,300 new with a warranty? For me, that's where the smart money's going right now in the Rolex Tudor Empire. And because we never talk about them on the show, Chopard. 25 years of Chopard as a movement manufacturer. And we're talking about the Chopard, Louis Ulysse Chopard, uh, Calité Fleurier Jubilee 25. This is a stainless steel 39 millimeter, 8.9 millimeter thick and stunning sunburst dial equipped ultra thin dress watch and it is a double certification. You can see this Chopard has stepped out lugs that I adore. Sometimes these Chopard LU Chopard models are just too easy on the eye. There are no visual wrinkles to capture the imagination and hold your attention. But I really feel like with this two-tone dial in silver and blue, with these dart style indices, with these modified syringe hands and the stepped lugs, uh, Chopard has done enough to make this watch look interesting, not just easy in a kind of handsome but forgettable fashion, which unfortunately a lot of these Louis Elise Chopard watches are. This one grabs my eye and keeps it. I would also say this. Uh, this is a piece that is double certified. A lot of high horology watches make no explicit promise of accuracy, but this is a COSC evaluated and certified chronometer. It is also Calité Fleurier certified. This is a system pioneered by a number of different companies, including uh, Chopard, Vaucher, Parmigiani, and Beauvais during the 2000s to create a Fleurier area standard for chronometry and fine finish, something that could stand up against uh, the Poinçon de Genève for watches not made in Geneva. So we actually have that level of finish here, and there is a chronometry standard associated with Calité Fleurier, which you can see stamped in a queue on the drivetrain bridge. Uh, and, and this is both chronometry and finish, something that the conventional Geneva hallmark doesn't entirely embrace. Hopefully we'll see more of these, though, because it's the first First Chopard Calité Fleurier in steel, and this is a 25-piece limited edition, which means, gorgeous though it is, we're not going to see a lot of them in the wild. But it's even more enticing because at $14,500, this is incredibly reasonable pricing for finish on a watch that is available at what is, after all, almost Rolex pricing. So this is a very appealing watch and one of the best in the show. And because it's Chopard, no one's going to talk about it. But I am happy to run my mouth on its behalf right here. Viewer wrist shots number three, your analog on my digital. Let's start with Andreas W. of Sweden. He's actually here in Tenerife with his Rolex Explorer scaling Mount Tide, beloved of cyclists in winter training. We have Jonathan G and his Seiko preparing for night skiing at Boreal near Lake Tahoe. Very cool, and he tells me that the Seiko is modded, by the way. Right here we have Stefan B, 
continues our Watches and Wheels theme with his Revutomen and Genesis G70 Turbo. Guys, send those shots, I love them, with the car, the Watches and Wheels. We've got Xavier N. of Manila taking in a fair day with his full bracelet, Tudor North Flag, a lovely and wonderful Tudor watch that we just don't talk about enough. And Simon H. with his Explore 2 Polar Dial are in Napa preparing for spring in wine country. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at the watchbox.com. All right, let's see what's going on here. We've got Horatio joining in from Montreal. We've um, got Wolfgang Kohler saying 39, I think, Sean. Are we talking about the Chopard? The Chopard is, in fact, a 39. Um, yeah, Sean Hansen asking, LUC, you asked, I answered 39 by 8.9 millimeters thick. And do do do. Then we've got Chopard and Beauvais, Jumbo Jet Pilot noting, let's talk about some others that us non-watch snobs love. That's true, this is not the episode for Rolex, guys. I'm sorry, guys, but everything on this channel last week was Patek and Rolex, and I'm trying to keep them to a minimum today. Right here, we have J.H. asking, Tim, how do you figure Tudor manufactured the sterling silver to avoid tarnishing? I don't know, because sterling is actually 6% copper. So th if this is really sterling and not just, you know, a high percentage silver with some other metals alloyed, I don't know how they're going to deal with tarnishing, because copper, even alloyed with silver, does tarnish, and those watches in silver, rarely seen in the wristwatch era, do tend to turn people's wrists blue. So... I, your guess is, is as good as mine. It might be that they didn't. It might be that they're just saying, hey, it won't tarnish. It might be that there's some sort of galvanized or anodized coating on this that we don't know about. A lot of titanium watches use that to prevent the formation of surface titanium oxide. So what alloy did they use? I don't know. If it truly is sterling, I'm not sure they can make it tarnish proof. And then right here, watches, watching watches, saying, speaking of Tudor, I want to get a watch for finishing school. Should I go for a Zin 756 Diapol or a Tudor Pelagos? I would say go with the Zin, honestly. Technically, it's more interesting. It's also a tougher watch. Now, right here we have Mick in Florida saying there is a coating on the silver. Okay, so he's sort of backing up my notion that there's probably a coat over the sterling that prevents the tarnishing, something that could serve as an oxygen barrier. All right, watches and wonders. Here is just the watches I loved. And a lot of these are going to be nerd watches, so be forewarned. The Bulgari Octo Finissimo Perpetual Calendar. Every year we get a new Octo Finissimo. Every year it's an absolute showstopper. This is the latest world's thinnest world record holder in a line dating back to 2014. First we had the tourbillon, then we had the minute repeater, we gained automatic tourbillon, GMT, the automatic, and now we get a perpetual calendar, 40 millimeters in diameter by 5.8 millimeters thick. If you're wondering, the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Ultra Thin, the 26586 IP, that is 6.3 millimeters, so this is a full half millimeter thinner, and it is a retrograde celebrating the Gerald Genta brand heritage of the Bulgari manufacturer. I love that inclusion. And a no-nonsense movement. The fact that they managed to make it half a millimeter thinner than the AP and still include a display case back that thickens the watch, that is impressive. Now, it's 59,000 in titanium and 89,000 in platinum, but high prices, I know. The alternative, which would be a 5740G, uh, well, uh, you can kind of see. <laughs> Value proposition at 89000 in platinum for Bulgari? I wouldn't have thought so, but apparently. Now, Breitling. This is the one you knew was coming on a Tim Masso show. The Premier Heritage B09 Pistachio. For the last week, Breitling's Watches and Wonders buzz has pretty much fixated on the similarity between this watch and that watch. And that's unfortunate. It's irrelevant to Breitling's best watch of the year, which is 40 millimeters, manual wind, no date, with a pistachio green dial. Again, no date, Arabic numerals, pistachio green, 40 millimeters, 13 millimeters thin, which is, I'm going to say, quite thin for a Breitling. Uh, this is a watch that reminds me of my favorite ice cream flavor, my favorite color, and the ice cream that my grandma would buy me at Carvel in Coral Place, New York, when I was a little kid. I have all sorts of great associations with this watch. And it's got a manufacturer movement. Not every automatic movement adapted to be manual wind looks great. 
This one is better than most, however. And I'm going to go so far as to say that this is what a modern Breitling all-arounder should be. 40 millimeters is a great size. Can you imagine if more or less the whole Breitling lineup went back to that? You might finally have that one-for-one -one competitor to Omega. They're not at Rolex level yet, and they're not really close. But could this approach definitely threaten Omega down the line? Certainly in terms of perception, if probably not in outright volumes. Now, I'm also going to say don't underestimate the impact of downsizing. Here, less is more. And for $8,400 retail, I think the price for what you get is fair. Column wheel, vertical clutch, chronometer certified, 100 meters water resistant, and a three-day power reserve. Now, let's talk about the Vacheron Constantin Traditionnel Split Seconds Chronograph. I know, everyone's talking about the overseas ultra-thin perpetual calendar with skeleton dial. Cool watch, not the Vacheron I want this year. This is big at 42.5, but lovable in full platinum and ultimately only 10.72 millimeters thick. It's a multi-complication, automatic winding with a power reserve and a split seconds chronograph. This is the Vacheron you imagine in your dreams. A Vacheron that lives up to legend. Excellence Platine series right here, which means you can expect a satin finished, really, almost pebble-grained, solid platinum dial, and you can see it is labeled PT950 between 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock. Split seconds chrono, power reserve indicator, as you can see, white gold hands and indices, note half frosted, note half frosted hands, Dauphine style for contrast, and a caliber to match expectations. This movement first launched on the Harmony Collection in 2015. It's better used here. A rare peripheral winding automatic movement with twin column wheels, a forest of hand-finished components, and the Geneva Hallmark. This one, a 48-hour power reserve, and surprise, surprise, it features hacking seconds. This is $288,000, but what's even comparable? I mean, a no-date, ultra-thin, automatic winding, dress split second. There's not a whole lot of competition. This watch has the sector all to itself, and at under $300,000, it's not cheap by any means, but do I feel like you get what you pay for here? Yeah, I do. And again, as we started this show talking about what kind of life priority assessment leads you to buy a $160,000 Panther watch, this is just as ridiculous. We're talking good house money. We're talking enough money to buy a Lamborghini, but at the end of the day, if you like it and you can afford it, buy it. Have fun and never apologize. All right, viewer wrist shots number four. Let's see what you guys are saying. By the way, I think this in the future with a bronze, green, or salmon dial or a black dial leaves Vacheron some space to launch variants that are going to be scintillating. All right, viewer wrist shots number four. Mehmet K is a northern Maine, bucolic countryside with his ball cannonball and sprawling rural woods. We've got Michael M. of San Diego, enjoys a fine cigar with his IWC Aquatimer chronograph Jacques Cousteau. We've got Sen Wei, stuns with his Zinn Multicron Astronomic built by Galet for Zinn with a Valju 88 vintage caliber. We have Stephen D. impresses with the Corona Tokyo Chronograph 2 and a good read. Mark M. tantalizes with images of summer to come while on vacation in Cancun. And Wei Ben wins the photography honors for the night of seasonal special and a watch perfectly matched to the countryside. A Grand Seiko SBGA 413 Seasons Series and New York Cherry Blossoms. We have them down here in the Mid-Atlantic in Philadelphia, too. That just made my heart skip a beat. Send your wrist shots to mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com. All right, guys, let's see what you were saying right here. Tempest is saying, I'd argue this is no less ridiculous than a Lamborghini and vice versa. That's a good assessment. I think that pretty much sums it all up. We got Quarter's Eye saying, beautiful watch, Tim. Love Vacheron Constantin. And then right here we have Pilot Style 123 Space 4 saying, this is the best of the best and it will be 100 years from now. Sean Hansen saying, that VC is sweet. And Horatio, this movement from Vacheron is nuts. Horatio, I'm going to give you the final word. Thanks to everyone who joined in tonight. I appreciate all of you. You are the best audience on all of social media. Thanks to Sean and Josh, my studio audience. Time out, Tim out. Watches and Wonders largely out, and thanks for logging on.